Hey everyone, welcome back to Installation 00 and our breakdown of Episode 7, Thermopylae, of the Halo TV show Season 2. Now, a huge, huge episode, some parts throughout it which just gave me chills, and there's some really big narrative moments that have been explored in this episode. But before we really get into that, I wanted to pitch an idea uh, to you. I've been thinking about making content that extrapolates specific things within the Silver timeline. I thought to myself that, of course, for the majority of my viewers, we're Halo fans first and foremost, which means that we're familiar with the games. If we're not familiar with the games, we're also familiar with the books. If we're not familiar with those two, we're familiar with the deep lore. But there is a huge portion of people who are likely coming into the Halo franchise for the first time via the TV show. And something I've realized through making these videos for the two seasons so far is that really a lot of the information about kind of the deep lore, or not even necessarily the deep lore, but some of the more poignant lore at the forefront sort of, of, the, of the franchise, hasn't really been extrapolated. If you ignore the fact that we're Halo fans, and say focus on, come into it like with a blank mind, no preconceived notions about what the TV show is about, what do you know about the Spartans, really, from the, from the episodes that have been, uh, been given to us? They're bigger, stronger, faster than normal soldiers, and they wear kind of a cool power armor. That's about it. There probably will be plans to extrapolate and to explore that a little bit narratively. I mean, there, there are small bits of lore uh, that are that are discussed in parts of the narrative when, say, Soren is talking to Halsey or when the Spartans are interacting amongst themselves that suggest to the augmentations, for example, but it's never been actually fully extrapolated and it's a good chance considering that it's the silver timeline and differs fundamentally to the mainline law that there are going to be some differences between what happens in the silver timeline and the mainline law case in point are the augmentations for the spartan twos in the silver timeline the same as the augmentations in the mainline law we saw from the last episode episode six that the spartan threes seem like at least at the moment normal soldiers wearing semi-powered infiltration armor. Meanwhile, we know, as Halo fans, that the Spartan 3s should be augmented. These differences are basically premeditating this kind of concept in my head that maybe I should put a little bit of stock, a little bit of, uh, of, of additional effort into making content that is specifically aimed at extrapolating the, the lore that is centered around the Silver Timeline but differs fundamentally from the Core Timeline but that hasn't really been covered in the TV series thus far, mainly almost as a kind of a primer series for people who are coming into Halo for the first time from the TV show and have no preconceived notions about the core of the lore, as, as demonstrated by all of the books and all of the games, but also as an opportunity for us who are well-versed in the lore to understand more fully the differences between the two timelines. That's kind of my overarching idea, and if you're, if you'd be interested, whether you, particularly if you're, if you're a fan coming into this from, uh, from the TV shows and nothing else, and have no prior knowledge of the Halo universe, would you like that information extrapolated? And again, for people who are already fans, do you think it would be useful to understand and and to explore the differences between the mainline law, and the Silver Timeline law? I'd love to hear your thoughts. So that's my opening kind of sentiments. Uh, on, on, on this idea I'm pitching. Now let's get on to the episode. So, again, normal kind of process here. We're going to go through the scene sequentially. We're going to give kind of a, a really rough breakdown of of the episode as a whole. I will pass some, some, some thoughts, some theories, some hypotheses on different scenes as we go. However, with this particular episode, there are some very... There's some very poignant and key moments, specifically for the wider narrative setting up and staging for the, the final episode and further than that into sort of season three that centre around Miranda, Halsey and Quan. So their storyline I'm actually going to group together and explain after I've done the rest of it. So bear with me, mainly because of what is extrapolated in those parts of the story. Again, like usual, got loads of notes so excuse me if I refer to those occasionally during the episode in either case all of that said let's get on to the breakdown 
roll the intro. So we kick off this episode exactly where we left off in the previous episode, and that's with Chief and McKee on the simulated at Halo. At the very end of the last episode, they were just making contact and, and, and kind of being launched into that virtual kind of domain-esque appropriation of the Halo. And their conversation during this interaction is really centered around their, their differences as both people and their ideological differences. Chief seems to blame McKee for the glassing of Reach, uh, because ultimately McKee was on Reach, and then Reach was glassed shortly thereafter. That doesn't lessen the fact that there is some degree of blame on Parangoski, there's some degree of blame on the Office of Naval Intelligence, there's some degree of blame on McKee, there's some degree of blame, in truth, even on Chief himself. But he basically just says that he blames her for Reach, and he warns her not to take the Covenant to the Halo. It becomes obvious in this scene that the differences between the two of them uh, and the lasting effects of the fall of Reach specifically have more or less killed the romantic relationship between Chief and McKee, which is good. Uh, as Pablo himself said, he, he didn't believe that it should have been a romantic relationship. It should have been magnetic, it should have been intense, but it should have been powerful, but it shouldn't have been romantic. This doesn't detract from the connection between the two of them. It's still going to be magnetic. They're still technically both, well, McKee calls them sort of blessed ones, the Covenant call them blessed ones, but they're technically reclaimers. It's not going to lessen the connection between Chief and McKee um, in in its magnetism and its 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 power and its intense in its intensity for, for their for their interaction. But arguably setting aside the romantic aspect is a, a very wise decision. So, moving quickly on from that, their interaction comes to a very abrupt end when Chief actually notices behind McKee, kind of in, off in the holographics, that there are elites behind her, and she notices there are soldiers behind him, and they basically remove themselves from this domain representation of the Halo and go back into the real world, so to speak. Uh, it's at this moment that the artifact that Chief is holding actually responds almost to protect the chief by creating kind of a, a, a concussive blast that knocks the soldiers that were behind him and, and lining up shots, that knocks them out cold. It doesn't happen with McKee. McKee just drops back into the bridge of the ship that she's on, surrounded by elites. It's awesome that we get to still see that combat taking place between the elites, but I like that there was attention to detail that the artifact seemed to respond protectively towards the chief but not towards McKee and that's kind of a narrative that's pushed through this entire episode. One kind of has to wonder if the fauna artifacts themselves are actually kind of demonstrating a will of their own. We've already seen so far many occasions where McKee's, particularly since the end of season one, has been struggling to activate and to interact with fauna artifacts, particularly the artifact they have, they're in possession of. She's no longer able to make it function and work and respond to her and yet when chief touches the artifact absolutely no problems whatsoever it immediately activates with no issue so i hypothesize that this is due to the chief being something approximating a kind of a higher class of reclaimer or there's a little bit more to it than just that so the original idea of the Reclaimers was that, were that all of humanity were Reclaimers. All of humanity could activate Fauna artifacts. During the kind of the, the, the latter end of Bungie's tenure as the, the developers of the Halo franchise and moving over into 343 Industries' tenure as the developers of, of, um, of the Halo franchise, it, it kind of shifted over to being specific groups, so to speak, of humans. Reclaimers became basically human beings that possess the genetic imprint from the librarian, who is uh, a forerunner life worker. These gene songs were something approximating kind of the ancestral genetic inheritance, so to speak, left over by the forerunner's direct interaction with earlier humanity, um, also known as, as Gesh. These humans are often, but not always, descendants of the librarian's kind of special population of humans that she had given these gene songs to. Gene songs can actually be expressed in different kind of levels of intensity. 
Uh, this is known as the pitch and cadence of a gash. This reef contains significant dangers, and even with your assumed legacy, I must verify the presence and pitch of your gash before allowing full access. Depending on the respective gene song and how it's planned out and how it's intended to be expressed over the thousand lifetimes since their original implantation, determines how pronounced that respective gene song is within the individual. And once a specific role or objective has been fulfilled by that individual as kind of guided by the gene song, it becomes recessive. This has happened in numerous cases with numerous individuals and numerous points throughout the Halo franchise. I believe in this case, McKee's gene song, while powerful enough to activate the artifacts before, she has now either fulfilled her gene song's objectives, so to speak. I'm not exactly sure how. Maybe her quote unquote death and revival at the bet interim between season one and season two has kind of made that gene song recessive again. I'm not entirely sure. But it, whatever's happened, it's caused her gene song to recess, which means the artifacts are no longer identifying her as being a reclaimer. It's either that or the Fauna artifacts themselves have detected that the Master Chief's pitch and cadence of his gene song is more pronounced and thus has something approximating a preference to the Chief versus McKee. Little, a little looser on that one. I, I think it's more likely to be that maybe the process of reviving her between the two seasons has caused it to become recessive again. Not entirely sure. Or she's fulfilled the initial objective. In either case, I'm throwing it out there as a, as a reasonable hypothesis. We do get some more awesome looks at the ensuing battle between the elites, and I actually agree. I've, I've, I've been sort of through social media and, and looked at some other videos, and I agree with many of the criticisms that many people had given the previous episode uh, when the, uh, the conflict initially broke out between the elites. It literally f it broke out, and then it was just focused on McKee on the floor crawling towards the artifact, while the actual battle ensued behind her with a soft blur. Not really the greatest way to go about that particular incident. And I, I, I think I speak for everyone when we would have liked to see that particular conflict extrapolated out a little bit more. So actually watch that conflict play out on a grander scale. And although I'm obviously I'm not a writer for the TV show, had I have been directing that scene or if I'd been writing for that scene or whatever the case may be, I think it would have worked significantly better if in those moments where McKee is on the floor begging for her life, and the Arbiter speaks about, you know, those who will stand with me, blah de blah, blah and then the conflict breaks out. I think it would have it would have made sense if we could have seen that conflict breaking out. Maybe a couple of elites attacked each other and, and McKee is kind of knocked aside. Bearing in mind how much bigger elites are than humans and how small McKee is, it would have made sense if she would have been knocked aside by an elite as they were as they were grappling with each other, and just the force of that blow, of that mass hitting her at that speed maybe shoves her into one of the plinths nearby or another object and just knocks her unconscious for a few minutes. And in those interim few minutes, we get to watch this conflict play out as more elites come onto the bridge and there's more conflict and we're watching this, the hand-to-hand the -hand combat of this conflict play out. McKee could have then woken up a few minutes later to the artifact beginning to glow as Chief was drawing close to it on the other side and, and then the scene would have played out more or less exactly the same. You would have had exactly the same result as a consequence of that scene, but we would have, as fans, gotten more of that, that direct conflict between the elites. Although the, the focus of that scene is still McKee getting towards the artifact to access it at the same time Chief does, we still get to see a little bit more of the backstory going on there. That's what I would have done. But in either case, this, this episode isn't about last episode, it's about episode 7, Thermopylae. So in any case, going back to this scene, we see McKee notice Cortana's chip is just on the floor in the centre of the bridge, and she scrambles to get it while the priest kind of lunges at her. She manages to get it and gets off the bridge, and is pursued by the priest. Now, I didn't notice this in the last episode, but the name of, the last name of the priest is Umdama. Now, that may or may not be in relation to Jewel Umdama, who was the elite who ended up leading the Covenant Splinter Faction during the, uh, the events of Halo 4 and, and the start of Halo 5. Maybe a relation there? Might not. Not entirely sure. In either case, the priest is confronted by Cortana in a separate room, uh, who speaks Sangheili to the elite. So she's kind of learned the translation uh, for from English to Sangheili and is actually directly interacting with Species of the Covenant, which is 
fantastic to see, which may play into perhaps either the next episode or the next season when Cortana and Shiva finally united, Cortana could then use that translation algorithm she's developed to translate the live speech of the Sangheili and, and, and brutes and prophets and other species of the covenant that Chief is around at any given time on the fly, enabling Chief to hear in his helmet what the covenant are saying in English, which then allows the, the covenant language to somewhat fall away and be replaced by English dialogue, making it a little easier to follow. Because I don't know about you, I, although it's not a universal truth, generally speaking in these kinds of scenes where we're getting like English subtitles to an alien language, I spend more time reading the subtitles than paying attention to what's happening on the screen, which I feel detracts for the experience, from the experience for me, because I'm, I'm then spending time reading and not watching the show, so to speak. So making that, sh that shift over also makes it significantly easier for the voice actors because then they don't have to voice act an alien language. They can voice act in English and, and it can be given the, the necessary effects to make them sound as cool as they do in the games where they speak English but in their own natural alien tonalities. In either case, the interaction between the priest and Cortana is all just basically a distraction because the priest is ambushed from behind by McKee with an energy dagger and she manages to take down the priest. McKee then asks for Cortana to show the star map uh, and uses this to pinpoint the location of the halo. That was kind of the driving force behind why McKee needed to access the artifact in the previous episode. She needed to access the artifact to go to the holographic representation of the halo to track the stars and constellations around the halo so she could match that up with a real life constellation thus finding its location. And with this reveal that she now knows the location of the Halo, we are pitched and ready for this to roll into the events of Halo CE. Then we get the title credits rolling, which again, the music to it never gets old. We then join Ackerson and Parangoski discussing the fall of Reach and how Chief's survival complicates that matter. We're seeing more and more hints that Ackerson is having second thoughts about practically everything that's taken place. Uh, it's revealed that the Covenant fleet have arrived in the Soel system, which should ring alarm bells for us fans of Halo. The Soel system is the star system that the first Halo is found in. So this clearly matches up with the fact that McKee has found the what system the Halo is in, she's journeyed to it, and they've been pursued by the Covenant fleet. The next scene we get is Chief moving through the Oni facility, uh, guided by Cortana. A team intercept him, and the team just so happens to be being led by that asshole Oni spook. Uh, Chief goes full boss mode here, and kind of somewhat, somewhat almost pulls rank and speaks directly to the soldiers, uh, and convinces them to stand down. He is the Master Chief, after all. Uh, when the spook attempts to pull her gun, Kai appears and knocks her out, uh, and finally sides with the Chief, despite the fact that he kind of says he didn't need her help. <laughs> Back to Oni Command, and we get a very brief scene showing a tactical display showing the first wave of Spartan 3s arriving at the Covenant fleet to perform, I suppose, the mission that they've been training for in the battle sims we saw in the previous episode. Literally moments after their arrival, the entire first wave is destroyed, uh, and Parangoski almost immediately orders the second wave to go, and Ackerson very quickly contests this choice. He is finally beginning to see Parangoski for who she is, for what she truly is, seeding his eventual rebelliousness that progresses through this episode. We next join Soron and Lyra. Lyra? It's one way or the other. I, I've noticed it in this episode that, that Soren said her name, and I think I've been mispronouncing it, but it's, I can't remember if it's one way or the other. Excuse me for that. Um, he recalls his experience in his training uh, in a very similar kind of set out to what he's witnessing here on Onyx, except his one was obviously done on Reach. He explains that only five of them stood kind of towards the end of this training mission, and that was him, Riz, Kai, Vanek, and John. They ultimately stood together, they fought together, and technically they lost together. It's revealed that Sauron was actually somewhat hoping for a way back into the Spartan program, which is an interesting turn for him. I think he's kind of somewhat realised that being a Spartan, particularly after the fall of Reach, it's kind of, kind of driven home how important the Spartans are 
um, it's kind of highlighted how it, how being a Spartan means something, and being a pirate on the very edge of human-controlled space doesn't really amount to much. So he's kind of seeking more purpose in his life again. It's, it's an interesting turn for him. And he goes on to suggest that they shouldn't try to find Kessler before this particular training mission that they're evidently going to put him on kind of takes place, because he feels like he's about to go through this, a similar training moment where he will learn, it'd be like a seminal moment in Kessler's life where he will learn who he is. And he's kind of almost making the choice not to interfere with that, which is, as a father, that's odd for me to think of, that I'm going to willingly stand back and allow my child to be injured, hurt by someone who, particularly knowing that Kessler might not have, have chosen this life, just taking a step back and letting it play out feels odd, and Lyra is is angered by this, or quite rightly so, uh, and contests that he has a life, a son, a wife. Him wanting to go back to being a Spartan basically forsakes all of that in favour of this life that he left behind. We jump over to the second wave of Spartan 3s who are prepping to deploy. It's very clear that there are kind of pre-mission jitters and nervousness. That are, that are playing out here, and it highlights the fact that the, the Spartan 3s are still not really truly battle-tested. This is their first mission, which again is not unlike mainline lore, where the Spartan 3s were so young, augmented, sent out to their first mission, and it was a suicide mission. They all died. Nearly all died. I still can't decide if they're actually augmented or not. I can't decide if, they're, if, if they've received Spartan augmentations that are just less pronounced than Spartan 2 augmentations, or if they're just normal humans wearing SPI armor. And unfortunately, in this entire episode, we still don't find out, because we don't actually see them in active combat, so we can't see if, the, if their physicality is superhuman. So, unfortunately, we're going to have to wait for the finale to find that out. Chief and Kai move through the only facility as Cortana continues to open doors for the Chief, very like the Superintendent from Halo ODST. Uh, with a dialogue between the two of them being mainly about Kai's choices, her mistakes, and, and driving that idea that, you know, that she's human. Humans make mistakes. And Kai kind of spinning that on the chief and, and saying, you know, you're human too. You know, you're not, you're not a machine. You make mistakes as well. You know, give me a break, so to speak. In any case, chief is focused on finding his armor. And that's exactly, I think, what Cortana is leading him to. Next we see Axon actually running a simulation with the spike and discovers the truth of what it really is. It isn't a virus to kind of kill the ship systems, it's something much, much more nefarious. When he goes to leave, Chief and Kai enter the room. Uh, there's a tense moment with Chief lifting Axon off the ground by his throat, but he releases him and, and Axon explains that the spike compresses the Covenant ship's pinch fusion reaction, basically rendering it into an immense nuclear bomb. The scale of the destruction is on par with that of the Nova bomb from the mainline law. And the physics actually kind of check out. The basic premise is relatively simple. Any nuclear explosion is immensely powerful. However, if you can contain that explosion for even a nanosecond longer, it boosts the thermonuclear yield. This spike basically deploys a virus that uses the Covenant's own reactors for their ships against them and turns them into bombs. Now, the Covenant reactors use a technology called Pinch Fusion Technology. I have a most detailed archive on this particular subject. Um, I'll put that in the card at the top of the video. I'll also put it in the description and the top comment for your reference if you want to kind of read up on the subject. But the short version is this. The Covenant use powerful graphitic manipulation technology and containment fields to pinch a plasma medium into an immensely dense and focused point, replicating the conditions of the core of a star. This creates a sustained nuclear fusion reaction where immense energy is produced and harvested from the reaction to power the ship. The virus basically overpowers this series of systems, causing the gravimetric generators to ultra-compress the fusion reaction and the containment fields to hold that reaction for as long as possible. This causes the nuclear fusion reaction to drive to incredible energy levels, almost instantly fusing lighter atoms into denser and denser and denser atoms then instantly releases the containment field and gravimetric uh, arrays to release that explosion all at once. This causes the nuclear fusion reaction to rebound, boosting its thermonuclear yield. The Covenant ship's energy shields may even play an additional role here as well, where as the explosion boils outwards, it would hit the inner surface of the energy shields and be redirected back in for another kind of rebound effect before the energy shields themselves fail. Again, 
boosting the thermonuclear yield to a point where an explosion that would have been only powerful enough to destroy that respective ship can wipe out an entire fleet and practically anything else nearby. And with that revelation, they kind of realized the enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of scenario. They're all on the same side and they all depart to take Chief to his armor. So they finally enter the room that the armor is standing in, and Kai's is obviously missing, but Vanex, Riz's, and Chief's armor is standing there. The way they look stood on the plinths with like the attached armature and everything to kind of support the weight looks really cool. Uh, Chief actually goes to Vanek's suit and explains to Kai what actually happened to him. Uh, Kai is, is moved nearly to tears, and then Axon asks what they're going to do. Chief tells him he's going to tell everyone as in he's going to act as in he's going to tell everyone what happened on Reach uh, and what happened on Onyx uh, for what he did and for blindly following Parangoski's orders. He argues that he doesn't have any proof, but then Chief counters that he will be the proof. The fact that he survived Reach and that, you know, the armor was taken from him and everything, that makes the proof that, that they need to sell that narrative. Because obviously the wider narrative that's being driven by the Office of Naval Intelligence is that Chief died on Reach uh, and uh, him being alive proves that that was a lie. Axon accepts this uh, and goes to try to make things right, leaving Chief and Kai. Chief and Kai have a conversation about their differing missions going forward. Uh, Kai makes it clear she's going to go with the Spartan 3s as she's kind of developed something of an attachment to the Spartan 3s. They're her Spartan 3. So she's very much stepped into the current role now. Chief is actually slightly emotional, probably knowing full well this is probably the last time he's ever going to see Kai alive. He even references that if it does come down to it, to it, it just being her with the spike, um, but before he says anything, Kai cuts him off and, and basically just tells him to get to the halo no matter what. So I believe from this, Kai is probably going to end up uh, being the, the one who activates that spike and, and thereby activates the kind of Nova Bomb scale explosion sacrificing herself in a very similar way to how Kurt did in the mainline lore. Kai leaves and Chief stares at his suit and the, uh, the mirror image, the, 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 the scenes that are shown with the mirror image of him showing in, in Chief's visor, I believe is kind of a symbolic moment that while he is the Master Chief and the suit makes him the Spartan that everybody needs, he is just, um, just as much a Spartan or kind of THE Spartan out of the suit. The suit doesn't necessarily define him, it only enhances kind of what's already there. And, and this is this is emphasized and, and kind of driven home in, in a following scene between him and Perez, but we'll quickly cut away to McKee, who's now kneeling by the, the branding device that had the mark of shame on it. Um, the Arbiter pledges his loyalty basically to her. Uh, she admits that she can't actually foresee anything now, that the artifact isn't responding to her, that she's kind of fallen from grace, so to speak being completely forward and truthful with the Arbiter, but it's not that that the Arbiter is, is, is kind of supporting her for, it's the fact that she is delivering truth, so to speak. So he accepts her gesture nonetheless, uh, and she solidifies that by branding herself with the Mark of Shame, which thereby, bond, thereby bonds the two of them together. At this point, I think it's just a foregone conclusion. We are looking at the origin story of the Heretic Elites here. It's no debate in my mind now. These are, a, are, are it's a ship with with crew on board who are loyal to the Arbiter. That Arbiter and McKee's kind of pledge together for seeking the truth and knowing full well that the Great Journey is a lie and the prophets are false prophets. All of that. It just lines up perfectly with the heretic elites that we know fully established in the mainline lore. On top of that, the heretic's base is in a gas mine that's hanging in the upper atmosphere of the planet Threshold, the gas giant around which the halo orbits. And they're in the system. They're in the Soel system. So at this, at this point, I don't think it's even a debate anymore. These, these, we are looking at the heretics. And I quite like that, the, 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 the duality, so to speak, of that, because we get then the Arbiter here becomes the heretic leader an Arbiter level, so to speak, uh, elite. And then we have, hypothetically, Thel the Dam, who is currently leading the, the fleet that has pursued him. And I assume at some point or another, he's gonna end up failing in his mission and become the Arbiter we know and love. Then when that first mission happens, you know, we get two Arbiters 
in opposition to each other coming face to face. That's quite nice. I like I like the mirror and parallels there. We briefly rejoin Soren as Kessler enters into this training area and Liera is trying to get to him. Soren intervenes, takes down the trainers. Kessler demonstrates that he's uncomfortable, so to speak, with his father. He doesn't perhaps trust him um, and kind of backs away. I'm not exactly sure what's going on there. I'm sure that will be extrapolated out either in the next episode or maybe next season. In either case, Lyra is captured and taken away with Kessler, and Soren is attacked again, which he manages to quell again, but leaves him alone in the training grounds. Going back over to Chief, Chief is now armoured up. He finds Perez uh, and talks to her briefly about their differing missions. Uh, here we expand on this idea that his suit just enhances what was already there. Chief talks again on his survivor's guilt, basically speaking of the fact that they, you know, they, they never talk about the soldiers that never come back. They only celebrate it as a victory and say that it was because of him. And Chief has obviously kind of retroactively taken that on board as meaning that, okay, yeah, the victory was because of him, but equally so, the deaths were because of him. So it, it demonstrates his survivor's guilt um, and his evident PTSD. And that, that's been a theme that's been consistent through the entire series so far, or through the entire season so far. Uh, because no matter how good of a soldier you are, no matter how disciplined, no matter how seasoned you are, I don't think any soldier truly leaves the battlefield with no PTSD. Uh, there's an offer of obviously differing levels and severity of it, but I don't think any soldier leaves an active combat zone after seeing what soldiers see completely scot-free they don't get away with that and, and come back to civiliz civilization so to speak completely normal so it, i like that they've, they've made this dark undertone of ptsd even for spartans and it must be dialed up to like 11 for spartans because they see so much more i mean that was kind of part of the thing that was going on with kai in season one when she was kind of like just in a daze on the battlefield seeing the soldiers around her you know injured um while she was still being shot at, it was just it's PTSD. It's, tra it's a trauma response. In either case, in re in response to Chief's kind of feelings like you know, are oh, their deaths are equally you know because of me. Perez counters that and says it's nothing to do with what he did, but of what he is and who he is. And she knows that it, that is the case. It's it's who he is. It's what he is that makes him the person that people kind of respond to and 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 have have almost made an icon and, and uh, is a legend because of what he does and who he is and the armor while the narrative through the entire season so far has been you know chief is just or john is just um, a guy in a suit um and the thing that makes him special is the suit it's actually completely the other way around it's john that's special the suit just enhances what's already there and we're finally getting to that place now where who John is as opposed to the Master Chief is being repaired, it's being reconciled almost. This season has had significant progress in reconciling the two and bringing them together as both John the Man and Master Chief the Legend. We're just now getting to this place where both of those kind of disparate personalities of the iconic hero are finally beginning to align and he's, he's, he's accepting who he is and what he is and what he's ultimately to become and again it it folds all the way back into some of the first things that were highlighted in, in, in episode one of this season about a lack of faith you know he has no faith he does he's finally now developing a faith in himself a trust in himself of course the other thing that was referenced is that he doesn't have any family the people who are closest to him whom he looks at as family were the other spartans the other spartan twos at the start of the episode, or the start of this season, sorry, he had family. He had other Spartans. And we're just now getting to a point where he's gained faith, something he lacked at the start, but he's also lost most of his family. And I think that's, a, that's, that's something that is really heavy. And I think a lot of, again, a lot of veterans will respond to because the bonds you develop with your brothers and sisters in arms on the front lines when you're in combat is just different from the, your normal relationships with other people you're you're relying upon these other people in a life and death situations uh, in in the most traumatic conditions that you can imagine so naturally the bonds between brothers and sisters in arms is just that much more pronounced and i think that this is just a beautiful way to 
to, to, to offset those two, those two things, those family and faith against each other. He had no faith at the start, but he had family, even though he may not have recognized it. And at the end of the season, or you know, the penultimate episode, he has faith, but he's lost his family. It's, it's a kind of a bittersweet reality of being a Spartan. It's, it's actually kind of beautiful, oddly enough. Again, this kind of theme is reinforced in the following scenes where Chief walks now fully armoured through the Oni facility and people just look at him in awe. And there's even like a video display that's showing like Oni propaganda and it's got like a, the main visage of the Master Chief and then underneath it the words, you are the Master Chief. And it's, it's on screen, Chief stops and looks at it and it's almost like an, it's almost like, it's a, it's a double-edged sword I think. It's one, it, he looks at it and sees it's Oni propaganda and he kind of thinks to himself, sake you know so to speak it's ridiculous that that is being broadcast to humanity under the assumption that he's dead when he's not but also the other edge of that sword is that he looks to it and it's affirming it's almost like that image is speaking to him directly he is the master chief so that that was just a, a nice little mirror and obviously there's 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 clear things that can be taken away from the idea that everyone is the Master Chief. Because again, that, that harkens back to the games. Like the reason why Chief was an empty vessel character, very stoic, didn't really say a lot, never took his helmet off, we never really knew who he was underneath, was so that we, the player, could superimpose our own personality onto him as a character so that we could inhabit the armor, we could become the Chief. So we all are Master Chief. So again, it, the obvious parallels can be drawn there as well. But, but I like the symbolism, so to speak, of it being both only propaganda that he recognizes as being only propaganda but also an affirmation of who he is. It's nice. We switch to Ackerson and Parangoski, butting heads once more about Ackerson, kind of looking through the simulations without clearance. Uh, Ackerson is challenging her on the, the, the missions and her actions surrounding the Spartan 3s as they get notified that a condor is spooling up. When they hail it, Chief's voice replies and Ackerson smiles knowingly to himself. Parangoski's face here is a picture and she immediately orders Ackerson is detained and he while he's being pulled away explains that the story of Reach, the story of Onyx and the story of Halo will get out, people will hear it and they'll hear it from him and they're gonna believe him. Obviously she's Cinconi, she's Admiral Parangoski, she's gonna spin this in, in any way that she can to make it, you know, to smooth things over and to save face but there's, there's still something coming here. There's still going to be a kind of a chief versus only narrative. I just think it's going to be put off until after the Halo campaign, so to speak. Now with all of that covered, we're going to really quickly jump over to Miranda, Halsey and Quan because their, their scenes have been happening quite separately from all the other scenes, but the, the, the narrative that's being driven here, I, I feel comes across better if I cover it all at once. So all of these, all of everything that I'm about to explain happens over numerous scenes, like sort of fractured throughout the, the episode. So we jump over to Halsey, Miranda and Quan. I have to admit the scenes that happen between, the, between them all in this episode, I think is the major point of this episode. This is the major highlight of this episode. There are tons of references to the deep lore, as well as huge extrapolations to the lore of the silver timeline. Miranda manages to activate two plinths that contained at one point two devices. Halsey actually reveals that she unlocked one of them before uh, and when she did it, it contained two samples of DNA, both human and I assume Forerunner. They go on to discuss that the DNA could hypothetically be kind of an invitation, so to speak, to unlock the full potential of the human genome of the human species. While Quan is kind of just looking at the artifacts in the room trying to make sense of everything. This is where her kind of, I suppose, her gene song, her gesh, is coming into play. And it's it's actually really refreshing. I, I, cards on the table, season one, Quan's storyline made very little sense to me. There was some interesting moments, particularly with the, like, the vision she was having, you know, about the well and, and being the protectors, so to speak, of, of, of Madrigal. But really, her, her narrative there made no sense. In season two, her, her narrative has been hinting towards, or more towards, the kind of Forerunner legacy and her involvement in, in it with a gene song. And this episode has really kind of brought her to the forefront. And I like it. I, I really like this, this sudden twist in development. 
So as Quan is kind of trying to make sense of things, they continue to discuss highlighting the fact that, uh, that Halsey actually used these DNA profiles uh, to basically search through the human genome databases that they have to find candidates with a similar DNA profile. And then Quan highlights that she kidnapped the children, heavily implying that the genetic traits that the uh, that Halsey had identified to be compatible for the Spartan program for the Spartan augmentation procedures are the same data profiles or genetic profiles from the foreigners that they had on record, suggesting that every single Spartan 2 has a gene song, and thus should suggest, at least if we follow the narrative, that every single Spartan 2 are reclaimers. Now, this is somewhat contradicted by Season 1, whereby kind of Vanek, Riz, and Kai all can't activate uh, the artifact, but Chief can. Now, initially I thought this was something to do perhaps with the, the hormone regulator chip, the fact that Chief took his out and that's why he could access it, but the other ones couldn't. But then in Episode 1 of Season 1, Chief had still had his hormone pellet implanted, and yet he could activate the artifact there. And in Episode 4, Kai has her hormone pellet removed, and she couldn't activate the artifact. So it's somewhat contradicted, but the law also states that gene songs, generally speaking, become more pronounced or they regress and, and, and become recessive based on things that are going on around the individual at the given time. And if they are close to the, kind of the objective or the purpose behind their gene song, it becomes more pronounced when they're around it, less pronounced when they're not. So it might just be that the other Spartans do have gene songs and do have like kind of purposes as reclaimers, but that they just haven't met their particular requirement, so to speak, yet for that to be expressed. That could be a reason behind it, or again, it could just be driving this idea that the chief is kind of the guy. It's, it's hard to say at this point. When you reference those aspects about the deep lore in regards to the gene songs, things kind of do fall in line with the mainline lore, but the problem here being that Riz is no longer active duty, Vanek is dead, Kai is probably not long for the world, and Soren is too far from any foreigner artifacts at the moment to really play any major roles in things anyway. That being said, there could still be something that perhaps Kai could respond to in due course. Going back to Halsey, Miranda, and Quan, we get this brief moment where a seemingly stone-like object emits light, which is actually very in line with mainline lore because very similar um, kind of shapes and geometric patterns were touched by Fred in um, the first strike, I believe. And they glowed down through caverns beneath Reach and they followed them through to a kind of a huge chamber. So that's very on, on brand, so to speak. Miranda finally asks about her father, Admiral Jacob Keyes. Halsey explains the situation, tells her that she saw him at the end basically destroying any hope that she had left that he was he made it off reach somewhere on some evacuation transport he didn't miranda goes to leave but before she can Quan takes that glowing object uh, from the relic and uses it to activate a star map Quan places the, the little object into the star map and actually kind of floats there of its of its own accord Quan moves through the star map and moves stars into the correct positions matching the stars up with what she knows is in their night sky so to speak Halsey suggests that it's a test to see if humans are similar to foreigners in their understanding of mathematics cosmology and, and, and their innate curiosity Quan realizes that it's not that at all it's actually a clock and she begins to move the stars to different positions, matching them to the markings that she saw on the inside of the cave on the rubble. These positions match up with the star positions that would have been the situation for the foreigners 100,000 years ago. Because stars naturally drift over time, our night sky now, for example, isn't the same as the night sky even when the, the ancient Egyptians were around. So the, the positions of the, of the pyramids on the Giza Plateau, for example, are said to align with Orion's belt, but actually if you track the star maps and the star movements back to when the pyramids were built, it's actually off by quite a large margin to match up with Orion's belt and is a closer match to the constellation of Cygnus. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Once it's all matched up, it generates a, a ring-like holographic, very similar to the stone rings we see on, on Zeta Halo, that then drifts backwards towards the, the, the aperture door and unlocks it. They move through and there's like a cavernous expanse and there, an a, a light bridge activates and I quite like the way that that light bridge activates. It's, it's quite different from the, the way the light bridges activate in the games but it's still 
a, a cool way to do it. It's kind of a geometric pattern that, that kind of winks into existence. Once Halsey tentatively steps onto it to check that it is actually solid, they all begin to move across it to a door at the other end, which has two symbols on it. Now, one looks very similar to kind of the iris symbol or maybe even a guardian symbol, but um, Miranda here actually says that the center one is similar to the icon for growth or rebirth. We'll have to take that at face value because this is, after all, a different timeline, so it evidently means something different. The top one, however, I immediately recognised. It's the same symbol that appears on Fauna Flood research facilities. Miranda hypothesises that the top symbol has negative connotations. You're damn right it does. And may modify the larger symbol's meaning, and she references three words. Change, division, decay. My reaction, and I'm sure your reaction to this particular scene, was likely the same. That was the flood warning symbol. Halsey uses these, the device found from the second plinth as something of a key to unlock the door, and they move through. Quan begins to feel uncomfortable as they walk into the room. Either side of the room is lined with laboratory vials. You can see where this is going. And beyond this, they find the mummified remains of a foreigner clutching a device. Now, it's interesting to note here that the foreigners aren't wearing their armor. Now, foreigners and their armor are kind of synonymous. That They just, they happen. Uh, it, you will always find a foreigner in their armor. You'll very rarely find them not in their armor. So this already is kind of a little bit different from mainline lore. But um, they, they comment on the fact that this foreigner, this alien, is oddly humanoid so to speak very looks very human and they're clutching this device now the laboratory vials in the room begin to crack now i don't know if the room responds to the fact that the vials are cracking or it was the room res like closing that caused them to crack but in either case the room begins to close so they try to get out as quickly as possible halsey's kind of a bit awestruck they manage to get her out and uh, get back to the light bridge. The light bridge begins to turn off and they get they start running across the light bridge. Halsey stops halfway across the light bridge because below them in the cavernous expanse, lights begin to turn on and reveal a massive foreigner network of structures, spires and buildings, clearly outlying that Onyx is in fact, exactly like it is in the mainline lore, an artificial planet created by the foreigners. And it is just huge and expansive. I had chills down my spine when that when that happened. And Halsey is just staring at it, completely oblivious to the fact that the light bridge that she stood on is about to turn off and she's going to plummet to her death. So, they, so Miranda has to drag her off, basically, and, and they manage to just about get off the light bridge before it fails completely. Then they get back into the map room, and the map that they're looking at, the star map, is changing. And the star constellations are changing from blue to red. Halsey mistakenly thinks that this is a retelling of their history of the Foreigner's expansion through the cosmos. And Quan realises, just as we realise at the same time, that that isn't what's going on. This is the story of their, of their empire falling, not of their empire growing. Shortly after this, we cut to a scene in the lab where Miranda and Halsey are working with the artefact they recovered from the, the dead Foreigner. There's a few sentimental moments between Halsey and, and Miranda here, which is actually kind of nice to see. And then Miranda opens the device, and when she looks up to tell Halsey, Halsey's gone. The final scene that we get for the show, uh, we get the Spartan Threes and Kai getting prepped for the battle. A uh, final shot of Chief in the Condor in slip space, finally emerging in the Soel system with the Covenant fleet dead ahead and the gas giant threshold dominating the space. Chief finally sees the Halo and McKee and the Arbiter's ship heading straight for it. And that's where it's left. And for a penultimate episode, that was... I had chills throughout most of this of this episode. Just some huge world building moments, some huge ramifications for the lore and the, and the storyline, both in the final episode and for season three. All in all, it was an episode filled with narrative expansion and priming for the final episode, and ultimately what will continue to be the narrative in season three once it's greenlit. So overall my thoughts, I mean, I've, I've not got a huge amount of thoughts for this episode because I've already discussed a lot of them anyway, um, but my thoughts on the episode is the dichotomy of Chief and John, it, it seems to be finally merging. Chief is finding f his faith in himself and accepting his charge just in time for what ultimately comes next. He obviously needs to reunite with Cortana, which I'm guessing is the, the next plan, so to speak, before finally getting onto the surface of the ring. 
so Chief's journey and and the story of his self discovery and and wrestling with his his status as humanity's savior, um, his PTSD, his survivor's guilt, amongst the losses that he suffered recently. It's it's in its final stages of reconciliation, basically. McKee and the Arbiter are now on kind of a mutual journey of truth, which will, I'm sure, eventually lead to the establishment of the heretics and the, the heretic leader. I'm convinced of that now. The Covenant have found Halo, setting the scene for the, the space battles for Halo CE. Kai and the Spartan 3s are likely going to deploy, and I think it's probably going to be that Kai ends up being the last one standing and, and activates that spike and blows up a large portion of the fleet, leaving just a few ships behind that will then be left to play out the events of kind of the battle for installation 04 and i'm sure shortly thereafter high charity will arrive and in very similar fashion to what we saw in the games the arbiter we know and love will likely be aboard one of those surviving ships from the blown up fleet and and go ground side and then you know will ultimately be doomed to the failure of, of not protecting the ring and become the arbiter we know and love eventually departing on his first mission to actually take down the heretic leader the current arbiter in the tv show Ackerson's fate going forward is completely unknown but i'm convinced we haven't seen the last of him his portrayal this season so far has been fantastic uh, Soren isn't really in the right place to, to, to fulfill what I thought was going to be his purpose in the Silver Timeline as kind of a Sergeant Johnson character. Doesn't mean it can't happen in the last episode as we still have a huge space, or, a space battle to enjoy including like the UNSC and Covenant ships so we know the UNSC fleet is going to arrive in the Soel system so it's still all to play for. Now that Kessler and Liera have been kind of separated from him again I think there's a viable way he it could be queued up to allow Soren to get off world and onto a ship and over to the Soel system uh, for him to ultimately lead up a squad of Marines of, of his own, just like he does, uh, like just like Sergeant Johnson does in Halo CE. The reveal of the research facility beneath Onyx and Onyx's true nature of being like an artificial created world was just breathtaking. The the visage of the of the monster on the roof of the cave and the star map kind of retelling what I'm sure is the spread of the flood and the fall of the Fauna Empire clearly outlines that the monster is in fact the grave mind. We're getting clear flood references and I know that many will say that the flood are only supposed to be on the halos and this isn't strictly true. There are flood research facilities within almost all Fauna facilities in the mainline lore mainly because the flood were the single biggest threat that the Fauna's were kind of confronted with. Uh, so they dedicated a huge amount of resources to the study and, and hopeful counter to the Flood. It was ultimately futile, but in either case, the episode was a, just a great staging episode, basically. We're, we're now completely prepped and ready for the finale, uh, getting everything in place for uh, the final battles that, that then get us over into the events of Halo C, which I'm sure will be played out in, in Season 3. There isn't much to look at beyond this, because uh, what I've already said in this episode so far is, is kind of covered a lot of my thoughts on the episode as a whole. In either case, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the episode as a whole, um, as well as your thoughts on it, if there's a way that Soren can still be brought in and become kind of the Sergeant Johnson of the Silver Timeline. I'd like to know your opinions on if, if we're going to see, perhaps in the finale episode, uh, Kai's ultimate sacrifice uh, in basically... Fact, the, the same fashion that Kurt sacrifices himself, which will unfortunately mean we'll have to say goodbye uh, to Kate Kennedy's portrayal of um, of arguably a fan favorite character, Kai. And are we going to get a similar series of events to uh, the Ghost of Onyx playing out simultaneously to the events of Halo CE? I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of it. And remember to comment, particularly if you are um, new to the Halo franchise and have been introduced to it via the TV series. If you'd like some more Primer videos explaining some of the major narrative points, the tropes and lore foundations, and, and, and some of the deeper aspects of the Halo universe within the context of the Silver Timeline. I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of it, and until next time. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, consider smashing the like button and leave a comment below on what you'd like me to cover next. Big shout out to my patrons, Spartan10148, the Metarch of my installation, Falcon, Prophet Bear, Mikhail, Sophia, and Ashley, my dutiful monitors.
Darian, Scarab, Spartan0137, Anthony, Ghost, Aaron, Chris, Jacob, Sean, Element0, Somatic, Jordan J3, Dan, Mr. Keys, Directal, Gunslinger, Jacob, Van Mill, Echo, Evermore, Officer Cat, and Personal Devil, my diligent submonitors, my fleet of Strato Sentinels, and my loyal enforcers. And all the other patrons who have jumped aboard to support the channel, it means more to me than I can accurately put into words. Another shout out to my Tier 0 Transcendent YouTube members, Spartan137, Jacob, Schmitty, Talia, Fenrir and Born Stella, and all the other YouTube members keeping my installation running on that glorious vacuum energy. Shout out to John for, I don't fucking know. And if you want more of this kind of content, hit the subscribe button and the little bell icon so you don't miss any future videos. And consider jumping aboard yourself as a patron or YouTube member to keep the channel alive and kicking. Thanks again for watching. Take it easy, everyone, and find peace in the domain. <laughs>